Okay. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I love your posters and all your books and everything behind you. I think that's great. That really makes a nice, a nice background. Well, if I can't be proud of my uh, my book covers, then I'm in trouble. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it looks terrific. So, Fatal Infraction uh, is that the latest one in the series? The Mike Stoneman series. Fatal one? Infraction. I'm sorry, I spoke over you there. So, Fatal Infraction is book four in the uh, Mike Stoneman thriller series. Okay. How many are there going to be, projected to be? Well, I can guarantee there's going to be five because the fifth book is in production now. I've finished the first draft. Uh, it's called Perilous Gambit, and uh, it's going to be set mostly in Las Vegas. So that one is definitely going to be out. Let me ask you something about writing a series. Is that something that you did intentionally or was it something that just kind of a snowball effect, like you start at the first one thinking, OK, I'm just going to write one. And then the story just sort of grew legs on its own. <laughs> well, it's a little bit of both. Uh, the, the, the character Mike Stoneman started off in a short story. And uh, when I decided to launch myself into the crime thriller genre, I, uh, I took that character and I, I wrote a story for that character. And I, I titled it a Mike Stoneman thriller uh, when I wrote Righteous Assassin, book one in the series, with the expectation that if I liked it and if other people liked it, uh, it could be a series. It didn't have to be, but it was certainly something that was there in the, in the back of my mind. Are you traditionally published? Are you with a publisher? I am independently published oh, okay. for now. All right. Now, the reason I ask that is because the traditional publishing houses, the big five, um, typically like a series. Like if you pitch them one book, they're going to, eh. but if you pitch them a whole series, they're, they're more interested in signing you. You're 100% you're right about that. And uh, unfortunately, they're less enthusiastic about it when you're already three books into this series. Uh, <laughs> I was un un unsuccessful in getting a traditional publisher to be interested in book one. Uh, but I'm hoping that after I finish this series and I decide what I'm going to do next, that uh, I might be able to go that direction. I see a football on the, uh, the cover. Are all of the books in this series sports themed or football themed? No. Oh, no, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, book one, Righteous Assassin, was a serial killer chase uh, that introduced my characters and was a very traditional crime thriller. Uh, then book two was a completely different plot that had nothing to do with, uh, with the first one other than it was the same characters. Uh, book three, Lethal Voyage, takes place on a cruise ship. It's a, a murder mystery aboard a cruise ship. Book four, Fatal Infraction, is the only one that... Uh, that has a sports theme uh, at all. So it's a completely standalone story that is not related to the other books. Okay, so the continuity between all the books is the same characters, right? Exactly. And there is a, a little bit of a story arc that starts with book one and will, I don't want to say conclude, but at least will reach a, uh, an interim ending point at the end of book five. Uh, that involves the relationships between the characters, and and there's a, a little bit, of, a little bit of a story that goes from book one to book five. You don't need to read them in sequence, and the story doesn't get detracted from if you're not familiar with the the little bit of a story arc that there is. But that there is one for the readers who are paying attention. Can I ask you a little bit about your uh, your day job? Sure. Okay. So on your bio, it says that you're a corporate lawyer. Is that correct? I'm a lawyer in-house working for a corporation. Uh, I'm actually a labor and employment attorney. Okay, what is that? What exactly is that? What do you do? You negotiate union contracts? I do union contract negotiations. I handle uh, harassment investigations, employment discrimination claims, uh, benefits, compliance issues, all sorts of interesting things involving people. So how did you go from that to starting to write. What was it that sparked the interest to start writing? Well, I think all lawyers uh, are writers in some sense. I mean, we, I spent a lot of my time writing stories. They're stories about the cases that I'm working on. You know, it's, it's, uh, 
explaining to the EEOC why my company didn't violate the employment discrimination laws in some particular set of circumstances. So you you spin out a yarn about what happened and why it happened and the fact that it's, uh, it's not a violation of the law. So I'm a writer at heart and I've always been doing a little dabbling at writing uh, on the side, going all the way back to, to college. Um, but I, I wrote my first novel in the mid-90s when I... Uh, got um, laid off, actually, from my first job. <laughs> I had some time on my hands. And I, I, wrote a, I wrote a novel. It was a private investigator story, uh, which was a lot of fun. It was a little distraction from trying to find a new job. And uh, that was how I really started the concept of writing a novel. That was the first one, back way before self-publishing was a thing. We've got time for maybe one or two of your uh, talking points, if you want to you want sure. to do a couple of those? Let's see. Uh, okay. What was the most fun aspect of researching and writing this book? <laughs> well, I, I got to tell you, I'm a big sports fan. Uh, my father was a sports writer, and I've uh, I've been following sports in a lot of different ways. So, getting into pro football uh, as a story outline, as a story concept, was great. Uh, I I will admit to being a fan of the New York Jets. Uh, the, uh, the story in the book is about the murder of an NFL quarterback who plays for a team that plays in New York, uh, and their colors are green and white and they practice in Florham Park, New Jersey, and their owner's name is Woody. But I never say in the book that this team is called the New York Jets, which is a trademark of the National Football League, and I would never use that term, uh, in the book, but, uh, I am a fan <laughs> of the green and white. And uh, I had to research quite a bit for this story, not because I didn't know football uh, or, or not because they didn't have a concept for how the story was going to go. But there's a, a big element of the story that has to do with the NFL salary cap and what happens when you have a player who's under contract uh, who got a big signing bonus, as many players do, particularly first round draft pick quarterbacks, uh, if that player should happen to die. There's a very complicated formula for how the, uh, the, the, the bonus money gets transferred forward on the books of the team for purposes of the NFL salary cap. And then I tried to research that. I ran up against a wall after wall after wall of people were speculating about what it probably was, but nobody could really say for sure, which is, seems rather strange. Uh, it's actually contained in the NFL's collective bargaining agreement. Unfortunately, the contract between the NFL Players Association and the owners is not a public document, so you can't get it. Uh, I actually was able to make contact with a couple of people inside the front offices of a couple of different NFL teams and ask some questions and get sort of the inside scoop on how it works, because it's very important to this particular story about the timing of when the salary cap hits and win what they call the dead money uh, of a player who is cut or is traded uh, gets hit onto the uh, NFL team's salary cap. Uh, I got to tell you, dead money would have been a great title for this book. Unfortunately, it's already been used by multiple authors on, on multiple different books. So that one wasn't available, although I'm quite happy with Fatal Infraction. Uh, but doing that research was a whole lot of fun for me to learn about the, the contract and the salary cap and how that whole dead money concept works. Let me ask you something about copyrights, because you might be familiar with it being an attorney. I don't know. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, you said that you can't use New York Jets because that's a copyrighted name of a, of a team, right? Well, it's actually a trademark, a not trademark. a copyright. OK, a trademark. If you were to say use New York Jet, and drop the S at the end. Could you get away with that? <laughs> um, maybe. Uh, I have a feeling the NFL, to the extent that they are looking to enforce their trademarks, might take offense to that. Uh, it's a little too close to, to, to the actual trademark. And as a, as a practical matter, you really could probably use the words New York Jets inside the body of a book. As long as you didn't use that on the cover or use the team logos on the cover, uh, or try to market the book by using the team's trademark, you probably could get away with it. Uh, I decided I really didn't want to get too close to that line. 
because the NFL, among all sports leagues, is very, very persnickety about enforcing their trademarks and not letting anybody use the, uh, the trademarked terms without permission. Well, I guess you don't even want to come close then to, <laughs> to avoid any sort of lawsuits coming your way, right? Well, I guess not. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, you couldn't buy better publicity than to have your book sued by the NFL. And well, there you is could that. probably get the press to cover it. <laughs> there is that. Um, <laughs> certainly, if you're getting no publicity and all of a sudden you get a lot of bad publicity, it would be amazing to see what the book sales would be from that kind of publicity. I had a similar issue come up in, in book number three, Lethal Voyage, uh, because I'm a, I'm a big Mets fan and I always have a New York Met player uh, or, or coach or somebody from the team show up in my books uh, doing a little walkthrough cameo. And uh, in book number three, the person was Lenny Dykstra. He uh, played for the 1986 New York Mets, also played for the Philadelphia Phillies. And the depiction of Lenny in that story was not particularly... Uh, uh, let's say flattering. And somebody asked me, was I worried that Lenny Dykstra might sue me for defamation? Uh, as it turns out, Lenny had sued another author for defamation regarding the content of a different book. And the court determined that his reputation is so bad that he cannot sue for libel because nobody could possibly tarnish his reputation. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now there's something to be proud of. I guess so. So I didn't get the pleasure of being sued by Lenny, not that he would have bothered to sue me because uh, yeah, the book was not uh, high profile enough, probably, for him to notice. But if he ever reads the book, he'll probably laugh. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Who are some of your authors that you like, the people you read? I am a, I'm a big fan of Michael Connelly, uh, as many crime fiction authors are. I, I love his stuff. Uh, I'm a big fan of Sarah Paretsky. Uh, her V.I. Warshawski books are something I, I, I read just about all of them and, uh, and love them. I also like Linda Barnes, uh, speaking of female crime fiction authors. Uh, uh, all of these are authors who've written great series with wonderful characters and characters who come back and, and not just the main characters, but it's the side characters, the cousins. And, the, uh, and uh, in, in Sarah Paretsky's case, her, the doctor friend and her downstairs neighbor. And those are the kinds of characters that really give life to a, uh, to a series. And uh, I like to think that my books also have those kinds of characters, not just the main ones, but some of the peripheral characters who keep showing up again and again. And you kind of get to know them just a little bit and wonder what is they, what's their role going to be in the next book. So it becomes like a little family that you can look forward to reading about. Are you actively shopping your series to be picked up by uh movie studio? <laughs> I wish I knew how to do that. Uh, I would love it. It would be wonderful. And uh, I think the books actually would be appropriate for that kind of serialization uh, in, a, in a film or TV. It's difficult uh, to get somebody to be interested without having an agent uh, who's going to push that. I don't currently have an agent, although that's, again, something that I'm actively thinking about doing when I finish this five book series and can start taking a breath and moving forward with my uh, literary career as I move forward toward eventual retirement from my day job. Uh, so that's something that I hope will happen. I would love it to happen. I have a, a good friend who's a blogger uh, who keeps saying on his blog that this is going to be a Netflix series. Buy it now. <laughs> I just hope he's right. Well, I hope so, too. Um, the one thing I would say, because I've interviewed of many, many people in all sort of stages of writing from very famous writers who have had their film, their books turned into, you know, A-list Hollywood films to the ones that are starting out. And the one thing that seems to be a common thread between all of them is that if you're going to go down that road, be prepared to let go of your book in the sense of don't be too precious with the story because Hollywood is going to take it and turn it around and upside down and inside out. And you just have to take your nice big check and smile, walk to the bank <laughs> and leave it alone. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Uh, you want to change this character around. You want to make this man a woman. Uh, fine. Go ahead. Whatever, whatever you think is going to work best on the uh, on the screen is totally fine with me. 
I, I will say I, I write these books very much in a cinematic style. Uh, it's much, it, I want my reader to feel like they're watching the book, uh, not necessarily just reading the book. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, narrative that goes on inside the heads of characters. It's really more what you're seeing through the eyes of the uh, of the narrator and through your own eyes as you're reading the book. Uh, you ask about other authors. One of the one of the best books I think ever written is The Maltese Falcon uh, oh, by yeah. Dashiell Hammett. Yeah. And if you've ever read the book and then watched the movie, they are almost identical because the book is written from a perspective of watching the action and listening to the dialogue. And there's very little that the screenwriters had to do to change the book to make it into a movie. And, and that's kind of what I'm going for with these books is to have you visualize what's happening and, and enjoy it almost as a, as a movie that you're reading. Well, you may have taken the first step already. You've made it very simple for a conversion to a screenplay. <laughs> Let's hope. Kevin, we do have to wrap this up. We are out of time. Do you have a website that you want to give out? Sure. Uh, my website is kevingchapman.com. So www.kevingchapman.com. You can find all of my books there and order personally autographed copies. And I'll be happy to talk to all my readers through my uh, contacts there on the website. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming on. It was nice talking to you. Nice meeting you. Best of luck with your books. I hope they do well. I certainly hope so. And thank you for that. And good luck to you.